walks away from a job that pays $625,000 a year. He ended up making comments like, oh, you're too girly for this job. He didn't like how my nails clickety clacked on the keyboard. I am too smart. I work too damn hard to be treated this way. We have the ability to say we want more out of life than just comfort. How did your rich BFF become a millionaire by age 27? She worked on Wall Street, made 600K a year BuzzFeed, and left it all to make TikToks full time. Those TikToks turned into a passion and seven figures in income. Today, she reveals her secrets, why you need a mentor in the workplace, what the financial industry is really like as a woman, and how to turn your biggest insecurities into your biggest motivators. Please welcome your rich BFF onto the Carrot Podcast. I'm here today with a special guest. This is Vivian Tu, aka Your Rich BFF. We are here in Union Square, New York City. New York City! New York City. Vivian, you were a millionaire by, what is it, age 27, age 28? 27. 27. How much of this was a life goal, intentional, versus how much of it was, oh, I guess I'm rich AF now? I think I've always been really money motivated. So growing up, I had Chinese immigrant parents and they, I would say, came to the U.S. and they were very focused on survival. And I came here and I was like, you know, when I came out the womb, I was like, I'm here to thrive. Oh, wow. So you exited and said, world, you better f***ing watch out. Yes. And you know how I knew that, like, I felt like I had something to prove I got our high school superlative of most likely to succeed. Damn. And I never forgot that shit. Oh, so you were like, I've earned this and I now need to uphold expectations, not only to generations of Asians who've brought me here onto this earth, but also to, you know, my classmates. Yeah. You know, I started doing that the traditional way, the way that everybody tells you to, which is you go to the fancy college and then you get the Wall Street University job. University of Chicago, if I University recall. of Chicago. J.P. Morgan. I, you know, I wasn't going to say it, but fancy. somebody had to. And then I was like, oh, this is it. Like I got there and I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do for 40 years of my life. And sitting next to somebody that you hate for 14 hours a day brutal. When I started my career, I was working for my mentor, my manager. She's someone who I'm still very, very close to to this day. Like we get dinner regularly. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because she was the first person to sit me down and be like, are you like investing in your 401k? And I was like, what's a 401k? So I would say she genuinely changed the trajectory of my life and not in the way of just like being my boss but like being a genuine mentor, being my confidant, being someone who I could look up to. And here's the thing, when I got to work the first day, it was like 30, 40 white dudes and me. Damn. And my manager was also an Asian woman. So I was like, even amongst all y'all, I still have one, like I can be that one. Mm. Like she cut her teeth in the same environment that all these boys cut their teeth in and she made it so I can make it too. It was just a reminder that like I deserve to exist in this world. And I don't think a lot of people have that if you're not a white guy in high finance. Don't get me wrong, I got yelled at all the time because I was always making mistakes. Like Mm -hmm. you do get yelled at. Like people are not particularly soft or using the kid gloves on Wall Street, they're not. But it was always fair, it was like, you messed this trade up, you didn't de-risk this fast enough, or you made a bad call and now we've lost a bunch of money, but da 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 Fine, I can live with that. And about a year and a half in, the head of my desk got let go. And keep in mind, I had already interned for 10 weeks, had worked there for a year and a half. Like I had really been currying a lot of goodwill and positive energy Mm. with this team. Like I was seen as like rock star, superstar. Wow. Like some of the like more senior guys. Most likely to succeed. Most likely to, like they would literally call that, they'd be like, yo rock star, what you doing this weekend? And like, even though that was just them giving me like a cute little pet name, like that enforces, that reinforces an opinion people have about you. Yeah. Like this girl is smart, this girl is capable. And it was awesome. It was awesome to be seen as that person. But when the head of the desk got let go, basically 
almost overnight, I would say probably within a week or two, he let go of half the team or wow. they either left, went to a different shop because they knew that, you know, the writing was kind of on the wall. Like it was going to be a very changed environment, a very changed regime. And the new manager hired a bunch of his old buddies from a competitor bank and the culture changed overnight. Mm. And I felt like I was back at square one. Wow. Because I had put in all that time. I'd, I'd gotten in early. I'd stayed late. I had, you know, kissed all the right ass, frankly. I had done extra little projects to help out that like weren't even on like my pad or like my portfolio, like my, you know, portfolio of numbers, names that I had to consider. And I was like, damn, it's like, you just like flushed it all down the toilet. And so that was really frustrating first and foremost, but mm. the new head of the desk, found out that the summer before my trading internship, I had worked in commercial banking and I knew my way around an Excel sheet in a way that like a standard trading analyst doesn't. So you were like going, this is folks, you didn't even need the mouse. You could just keyboard shortcut your way through that model. Not nah, cut long. that mouse. I don't need that. Wow. Yeah. And frankly, also just like as like a child of the internet, like I know how to Google stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like if I don't know how to figure something out, I'll just Google it. Yeah. Whereas like, I would say like, you know, the desk was older. I was the youngest person on the team. A lot of people weren't Googling. They didn't know how to do that. And so he found that out and he was like, do you want to leave your mentor and come work for my BFF who's coming, you know, starting work in a month. And when you're 22 and the head of your desk, the new head of your desk, who you're trying to, you know, mm -hmm. suck up to, asks you that, that's not a question. That's a, do you want to still work here type of beat. Wow. And so I was like, of course, I would love to do that. So he's low key, like, I don't want you on my team, go on this team. No, 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 no. It was the same team, mm. but I had been working for my mentor, the woman that I love so much. And he had a guy who was like his BFF starting. And he was like, I want you to come work for him. Oh, it's like, so he just can move have a junior. Over, yeah, so yeah, yeah. he can have someone who's good and gets their shit done. Correct. And I was like, I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? Mark those words, my friends. What's the worst thing that could happen? He turns out to be this horrible person, terrible manager, is not invested in my learning, d like takes credit for my work, like doesn't ever even give me any sort of reinforcement. Like, hey, like this was smart. This was good. Mm -hmm. And listen, I'm not asking you to stand up at the weekly like, you know, meeting and be like, Vivian created the spreadsheet. But like in our one on one, at least like. Just be like, hey, this was good. Right. You know, instead he ended up making comments like, oh, you're too girly for this job or, you know, just being like not particularly nice. You're too girly for, for this, this job. job. You've been busting your ass yes. over a year. Yes. People are calling you rock star. Yeah. He's getting a favor by having a hotshot analyst like yourself under him and he's calling you too girly for the job. Yeah. He didn't like how my nails clickety clacked on the keyboard. Didn't like that, you know, I had like a little scrunchie in my hair, didn't like all the things, like he disliked things about me that frankly I wasn't going to change, that I wasn't going to be able yeah, to change. Yeah, you're unapologetic. You're like, I'm gonna be a badass and I'm also gonna be me. Yeah. Did so. he ever explain, like did you ever get the chance, I remember when I used to work on Wall Street, there's this culture where, as you said, you had to suck up to get promoted. Oh yeah. And if you didn't, then it'd be like, I'm doing all this work for absolutely nothing. And even if you didn't get the best treatment, you wouldn't say much no, because no one respected. And so when you hear things like he's calling out on being girly, did you feel comfortable saying or doing anything about it? Or was it just like, oh God, I just need to leave? No, you know, I was like, uh, okay, whatever. I just sucked it up and I was like, I'm, you know, I've got tough skin, I wanna deal with it. And then that was kind of the beginning and the end, but the straw that broke the camel's back was I came into work one day with a long cardigan on and he touched his hands together and bowed at me and said, ooh, is that a kimono? And I was like, this dude is never going to respect me for reasons that I can't change. He is never going to be in the back room pounding the table saying, Vivian is a rock star. We need to pay her. We can't afford to lose her to a competitor. We have to promote her. We have to give her opportunity. Like that was never happening for me. And I knew that. And I was like, I am too smart. I've worked too damn hard 
to be treated this way. Mm -hmm. And I knew what I had. Cause I was like, I have a U Chicago pedigree. I've now cut my teeth for two and a half years on wall street. I know what that looks like. I know that people will hire me. So I started interviewing. I interviewed with some hedge funds and asset managers, whatever. And I told my mentor I was doing this. And she was like, oh, well, I have a girlfriend. She started her career at Goldman. She was there for four years and she moved into the tech and media space. You wanna have a conversation with her? I'm like, I'll have a conversation with a brick wall if it means I can get out of here. Mm -hmm. So I ended up talking with this woman and funny enough, she ended up becoming my first boss at BuzzFeed. Wow. And I got that job, not because frankly I deserved it, but because I had a network. And I think it reminds me that it's so important. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Mm -hmm. I showed up to my media job. I was in strategy sales, day one. Couldn't tell you what an impression was. Couldn't tell you what CPM stood for. Couldn't tell you what was a good ad versus a bad one. What was a good partnership versus a bad one. Like I just had nothing. And this woman took a flyer on me and said, I think when you come up in that environment, you learn to work hard and that's what I'm looking for. And luckily for her, I ended up becoming one of the top sellers wow. at BuzzFeed. And I was paid very, very generously, very handsomely I remember for it. over five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars Yeah, yeah. Just insane. Like what, and like I, three and years, four years out of school. When you go to a place like UChicago and everybody ends up becoming a financier, a lawyer or a doctor, you kind of think that those were the only three options that allow you to make money. Yeah. And to prove to myself that I could hit the numbers that I wanted to hit without doing any of those three things and doing something where I could wear ripped jeans to work and go down to the Froyo machine halfway through the day for like a midday snack break. And that like I was allowed to live my life with dignity and respect and I didn't need to be called too girly or frankly too Asian that people were going to speak to me in a way that I deserve to be spoken to. And I could still get my job done and do it well and have that fulfillment piece. It was incredible. I have nothing bad to say about that job, honestly. I really don't. One of the greatest cons that the entire Wall Street investment banking management consulting complex have performed is convincing the graduates from top colleges every single year yeah. that if you don't end up working here, you suck and you're bad and your life's going to be sh Yes. It's so true. I was terrified in school at the prospect of not getting a job in one of those fields. And I remember all my classmates, we were the same. We do case interviews, oh. we go in finance clubs. You would go gossip. into the vault guys oh, and remember. you would read those like hundreds of pages. You would be prepping for these interviews. You would fly out to New York with your shaking and your quaking in your boots. Oh my gosh. And you would feel like if you didn't nail that interview, you were toast. It was a rumor mill where people in my year at Harvard would literally talk about, did you hear like Joseph got an interview with Blackstone? Well, like yeah. Connor got one with Goldman. Yeah. Who do you think is going to get the offer? Yeah. Like I remember Wall Street Oasis, the forum for everyone trying to break into investment banking would literally be gossiping about particular people, particular schools where you think they'd end up. Yeah. And I remember too, as you said, it's all about relationships. During the Christmas break of my junior year and I was recruiting, I ran out of minutes on my phone because I was trying to book as many calls with these 23 year old mm -hmm. people who were like, you know, lacrosse bros from Duke yeah. who are now investment banking analysts at like Credit Suisse and basically just like sucking their ass so hard to try and get a job. <laughs> yeah. And I barely even understood what investment banking was. I just thought no. like, I need this. The same way I convinced myself I had to get into Harvard to feel right. worthy. This was just the next thing. Yeah. It really was. And I felt the same way about colleges too. And I think, I'll be honest, I would say I probably place too much value in where I went to school. Mm. Like I find that to be like a defining characteristic about myself. Like I'm really proud that I went to UChicago because people know that like, not only is UChicago one of the top schools in the country, but like in particular, the type of people that go to Chicago you actually have to be smart. Like yeah. you have to be really totally. smart to really make it there. Like we have great deflation. Yeah. Unlike Harvard where there's a lot of athletes and legacies. Yes. Which not to say you Chicago definitely has totally. those. But the reputation was yes. everyone there is really smart. And I walked into my first like kind of like language, like reading, like uh, 
you would read like the classics and then you would write about them. And the guy I sat next to, he had won like a Pulitzer. Wow. Holy like sh as like a child. So like, he's just as a, a child teenager. prodigy. Yeah. What did he write? Like, what do you write when you're a kid? Just like, I don't even know. I don't remember, but he had won some like major writing awards and me being like, am I being graded against this guy? And I was. Terrifying. Yeah. Like even going into school, what was high school like? <sighs> I was very much like, I will do anything to get into a good college because my parents being Asian had like emphasized so aggressively how important an education was yeah. because for a lot of immigrant parents, the way that they got to this country was through an H-1B visa. And you know who got those? Doctors, engineers, lawyers, important, like high paid professionals because they felt like education was their only path up the social and economic ladder. Yeah. And, you know, in places like China, you can be the son or daughter of a rural you know, farmer, but if you're, if you got the sauce and you take those college entrance exams and you rock it out the park, you get to go to the big city. You get to go have that fancy job. You get to eventually have that penthouse apartment. And so even though we were no longer in the old country, like that was still very much instilled in me. So I gave up a lot in high school. I will say I still did have my fun. Mm, um, great. Shout out to being drunk and almost dead in a field. Uh, <laughs> Wow, so you were getting good grades in the CT scores, but also getting f***ed up in a field. Yeah. I didn't have that experience. Yeah, oh, I mean, now I can like look back on that moment and be like, if like if my child did what I did in high school sometimes, I would be like, please don't do that, please don't do that. Just like call me, like I'll come get you, it's not a big deal, but like I was just trying to let loose. Yeah, like work hard, play hard, let off yeah. some steam. And then when I got to Chicago, I was also very much of that camp, like, I was work hard, work hard, work hard. Yeah. Like I graduated with like a 3.8, like I was a good student, Damn. but I also was out every single weekend with my little fake ID that was like basically like crayon on a NYX card. Like it was so bad, it was like so embarrassing. Um, and I would, you know, I'd be downtown, I'd be drinking, I'd be like having a good time. I can totally see everything being said you absolutely killing in investment banking. Cause I no. feel like bankers are like the stereotype of what you just said, where yeah. it's like bottles and models. Usually it's like Excel models, models right. and like Perrier bottles, but sometimes they go out to the club yeah. and they let off a little bit tension, you know? I thought about investment banking as a career, but it was just so boring to me. Yeah, And I was like, oh, how can I do something like that? But like, insane but cooler like no but like fast paced yeah. high adrenaline like toxic bro call. like i wanted that because i thought that was cool and so that's why i ended up in trading trading is so stressful because you make the wrong decision you lose a lot of money instantly instantaneously yeah whereas frankly as a banking analyst a lot of what i was doing is rearranging logos on slides yeah yeah um all of my banker friends are like yeah i can tell the difference between 10 and a half and 11 point font and yes. I was like, really? Because I lost $4 million today. Or like I did something like, in, like you know what I mean? Like the, the stakes are just so high in that moment, especially in like very, very liquid, fast moving markets like equities, which is what I worked in. You know, I had some friends who were like in credit who would like research a trade or like think about stuff for, you know, hours or days or weeks on end. Whereas like, I didn't have that. I had to make a decision in about three and a half seconds and it was either gonna be the right one or the wrong one. What scared me about sales and trading was I didn't have the risk tolerance. I just knew if I had a $3 million loss, that would wreck my day, my week, my month, <laughs> my year. It would fuck me up. Yeah. And so going into it, like, did you really consider yourself to be like, hey, I'm an adrenaline junkie. Like, oh yeah, seven figure swings in dollars. I want that. Or was this more just like, no, no, no. I just need something fast paced. I would say I am more risk tolerant, risk loving than most people. Only in certain facets of my life. So like, yeah. I hate roller coasters, but like, I also get like motion sick. So like, I really don't like adrenaline that way, but there is something that I love about public speaking, wow. which I know is like almost like one of the top fears of all people. There is something about like the pre, like right before you're about to walk on stage, someone's announcing your name. There is something about that feeling that like 
is unbelievable. The for electric me. energy. It is. Crowd. Oh, it's so good. Oh, everyone's waiting for you, and you have a chance to share the story the way you want to tell it. I think throughout my career, I was always chasing the next high, which is why I was so good at sales. Cause like I would close a big deal and I'd be like, yay. And that would like last for about 15 minutes. And then I'd be like, what's the next thing? I almost understand it as the constant validation. Yes. It's like the purest form yeah. of checking in my veins. I'm very similar to you. I basically got into school because I did a lot of public speaking, yeah. mock trial, Congress and yeah, debate. Yeah. And when I was young, I used to wonder if I could get a job either as like a minister or oh, interesting. like a politician. Yeah. Because those are the only two things I could think of where you do public speaking on a regular basis. I mean, that's fair. I think I also felt like there was something just like sexy about what finance was portrayed to be. Cause like I had seen all the movies, right? Wolf of Wall Street, you know, money never sleeps. Like greed is good. But like when I got there, it was true. Like I was sitting in the box seats watching the red hot chili peppers. I was going out to fancy steakhouses. I was getting the opportunity to go to sporting events that like, you know, frankly, I could not care less, but like, it was cool to sit really close mm -hmm. to the core. It was cool to have everything paid for. And I really bought into it. There's a lot of brainwashing that also happens. Like when you go to a school like I did, or you did that, this is your ticket to success. And there's like also like a braggability factor, right? Like it's never embarrassing for your mom to tell the aunties that you work at a bank. So then how did you undo that brainwashing to then go to BuzzFeed and- Which does not have that exactly, braggability factor at, exactly. all, at all. Your mom probably has not heard of BuzzFeed and then leave BuzzFeed to do your own company, which I imagine your parents even more so are just like, holy f When I left Wall Street to go work at BuzzFeed, even worse than having never heard of BuzzFeed, my mom had heard of BuzzFeed and she was like, oh, you're gonna go write quizzes of like, what kind of cheese are you? And I'm like, that is actually possibly the worst preconceived understanding of this company that you could possibly have. And that wasn't the case. I was working on the business org. It was still relatively in the realm of like business of like what I had wanted to do. Um, but they were not supportive at all. Like BuzzFeed does not have any braggability factor for the aunties and we actually got into a fight, I wanna say, and didn't talk for like two or three months. And I'm an only child. So like, imagine not talking to your parents for two or three months. Like I call my mom all the time. I say my mom because my dad always just agrees with my mom. Mm. Like that's one thing that I will say, they were great parents because they were always a united front. It was a terrible experience for me because I could never trick one of them into agreeing with me. They were always both against me. And when I left Buzzfeed to start Your Rich BFF, I was so nervous to tell them and frankly, I didn't tell them about Your Rich BFF until I was already nine months in. Wow. Eight or nine months in, yeah. So they thought you were still at BuzzFeed. No, I was still at BuzzFeed. I was working my full-time job while building Your Rich BFF. Both, that's insane. I was mentally unwell. Mm -hmm. Like I was working five days a week at my day job. And frankly, it wasn't even like a nine to five job. Like you had to kind of put in extra elbow grease if you wanted to close more deals. So like I was, because I'm again, money motivated. And then on the weekends, on Saturdays, I would ideate all my content. And on Sundays, I would line up seven different outfits and I would just film, take off my shirt, film, take off my shirt and like, you know, change my outfit. But so it would look like I was filming a new video every day, but I was actually doing it all on one day. Vivian, what's motivating all of this? Because you were making six figures, high six figures yeah. already at BuzzFeed. Yeah. Why go and spend so much time and effort doing something completely new and different again? Why keep working? Maybe it was because I saw opportunity. Maybe it was because I was like genuinely passionate. Like I thought it was awesome that like my little video could like help make somebody's finances better. Like I love that. I love, I think at the core of it, it was like, I liked helping people, but I took a class in college and it was like the kind of like business behind altruism. There is no such thing as pure altruism because when you do something for somebody else, you also get a warm glow. It was, feeling like, you know, a little famous. That's like cool. People love that. Yeah, like, external validation. Yeah, external validation. Everybody in my inner circle was like so, so supportive. They were like, you know, you're like changing people's lives and they were saying all these nice things. And I was like, okay, cool. Even though the most important person in my life didn't understand why I was like putting myself through the ringer, working on the weekends to like do all this, I just kept pushing. 
Yeah. For whatever reason. And I'm really thankful that I did. Then I started making some money. And I certainly wasn't making a lot the first year. Um, I didn't know how to price myself. I was like, oh, I have like 150,000 followers. Yeah, I'll do a video for $300. Like I was like, sure, that sounds good. $300 is a lot of money. Then realized that I had to ideate it, had to shoot it, had to edit it myself, had to post it, had to monitor the comment. Like it's a whole ass job. Mm -hmm. When I decided to tell my parents, I had already made some real money. I wanna say like $50,000. And so when I called them, Cause I could tell that like the lie was starting to fall apart. My mom was like, why are you always so tired? Like what's going on at work? Your boyfriend are fighting a lot. Like what's going on? I like just couldn't keep up the lie anymore. And I was like, so I started a TikTok and it's now gone, I've gotten really big and like I'm a little bit famous and I'm like creating a lot of content, but don't worry, I've already made $50,000. Like I literally talked like that, like filibustered. So she could not get a word in edgewise. And when I said that, I like let it sit. And her follow-up question was, did you just say you made $50,000 doing this? And I was like, oh, I got them. Like, I'm not gonna get in trouble for this. Because for my parents, again, being immigrants, survival, very money motivated, they were like, oh, well, if this is just like a way to supplement your income so you can buy a house sooner, so you can start a family sooner, then we're okay with this. So on the one hand, I'm very happy that you know how to communicate with your <laughs> parents and what they care about, what yeah, their priorities. Yeah, yeah. On the other and I'm projecting here, I feel sad. I wish yeah. that they could be like, wow, this is really f cool what you're doing versus, well, you know, it could be like killing sewer rats for all I care yeah. about, but you made $50,000, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's what matters. Yeah, I know how to talk to them now, having been their daughter for almost 30 years in a way that like, I know how to position things now. Like I'm smarter than 13 year old me was. I mean, I totally understand you know how to just win them over. I think my question is like, do you have, for example, your fiance, people in your life where, hey, you know what? It's not just the money. It's just the fact that you're doing this at school. Because I'll tell you for myself, I went through a very similar experience. When I went from investment banking to management consulting, my dad was like, what the f yeah. Like, don't come home. Which is like so funny too, right? Because it's still an incredibly high I went from pace, Blackstone to McKinsey. And he and was, he was like, like mad about it. Oh, he was pissed. When I went from McKinsey to Facebook, he was like, why the hell would any engineer listen to you? Like you aren't yeah. even technical. When I left to do my own company, I remember I was really depressed before doing it because I wanted to do something new and I felt stuck in the corporate rat race. And he was like, why would anyone ever give you money? And the only times he started to come around were when I'd start to show Make that it would money. work from a financial POV. Yes. And so for me... I similarly, you know what wins him over. And I think I hold it's sadness. Because they're, it's because they're immigrants. It's because they have had such a scarcity mindset for so long. And when they first came to this country, their biggest concern was putting food on the table, keeping a roof above their, like roof above their heads. And I will say you and I are very privileged. Yes. I'm, you were born here, correct? I will bring Canada, but yes, yeah, totally. Yes. We were born here. We have a sense of, I would, I would say it's like positive entitlement. Like mm. I am entitled to thrive in this country. What you gonna do, deport me where? Like I was born in Maryland. Like, what are you gonna do? Whereas my parents don't have that sense. Even though they are now US citizens, they have blue passports. Like they always like, I don't know what it is, but they're always like looking over their shoulder of being like, is, another sh is the other shoe gonna drop? Whereas like, I don't have that. I don't have that scar tissue. And that's why for me, even when Your Rich BFF was a, not even a money-making endeavor, but like a money-losing endeavor, I was spending time and energy and my own resources to buy a ring light and like equipment. Like for me, it was still worth it because it was something that I could pursue that I was passionate about. They don't understand that. There's no such thing as passion. There's things as money. There's things as quantifiable measures of success. Whereas I would say like our generation and like, people who don't come up in a environment that's as scary as our parents might have grown up in. Like we have the ability to say we want more out of life than just comfort. What's that balance between optimizing for passion and optimizing for money look like for you? For example, say your rich BFF had taken another 
two years, three years before you had even made $50,000, would you have continued to invest time and energy into it? Or would you said, oh God, this isn't working? I was very fortuitous in that like I had the ability to be committed and also the work ethic to be committed because I still had to give up every single weekend. Let's talk about that. Um, but like it was mid-COVID. People were on their phones all day, every day scrolling. It was so easy to go viral. And I was able to make all this content, bank it. People were watching it. This was also the time of like the GameStop saga. This is the time of Dogecoin. Everybody was just talking about money in a way that we haven't seen in recent years. And so I had all of this fodder and all of this content to be making. And people came to me and expected me to be able to explain it to them. I don't know why I felt like so strongly about this that I was willing to like put in the first six months without making a dollar, but something made me do it. Maybe it was just because I was also like working from home and like could. Yeah. You know what I mean? I remember the first few pieces of content you made was almost even more just for your friends. It was for my friends. The first piece of content, like the couple first videos were all for my friends at work who were asking me questions like, what are you investing in? What should I be buying in my 401k? What is a 401k? Which health insurance plan did you pick? How did you know all of this stuff to even been able to share this knowledge with them? Because my mentor taught me. Mm. I would tell you like, yes, I learned a ton about finance. I learned a ton about money while on Wall Street. But all of the real life practical stuff, she taught me. I think 2020 yeah. just helped everyone realize money's really important and we don't know what the fuck it is. And to your point, I literally worked in banking consulting for years and like I didn't even like know how to do my own taxes. Right. I mean, like we don't learn that, right? Like I took a wood shop class to make a gazebo in high school, like sick. You know what I have never ever had to build on my own before? A gazebo. Like, you know what would have been helpful? learning how to file a tax return so that the first time I did it, I don't think I'm going to prison because that would have been a lot more. I'm still scared of going to prison oh, when I do my taxes. 100%. They like ask all these questions and I'm just like, hmm, did I commit tax fraud this year? It's like, no, you didn't. Like, did you, like, did you happen to do any of these sketchy things? Do you have any crimes to report? It's like, no. Oh, I love, yes, that the IRS requires you to report income from illegal activities. Right. And that's how they get a lot Al of- Al Capone. Yeah, that's, that's how, how they, they get Al people. Capone. They get them for tax fraud instead of the actual activities they committed. I also really love that you cared so much about this. You spent a year, you have the cost benefit analysis. What was the moment where like, I'm going to quit my goddamn job? <laughs> And turn the passion project into like, this is now my thing. Like I am Vivian, your rich yeah. BFF. I was working at BuzzFeed and doing your rich BFF for a year and three months before I left to do it full time. At first it was like, cool. I was like, whatever. I like cleared it with company compliance. I told my boss, everybody knew. So it wasn't like a secret. I told my fiance, I was like, I like hate my job. I hate your rich BFF. Everything is bad. He said, did it ever occur to you that like, you don't hate either of these things. You just hate doing them at once because before your rich BFF, you loved your job. You loved your boss. You loved your coworkers. And when you first started your rich BFF and it was so easy, you loved making that content. You loved doing social media. You loved interacting with the besties. But now that it's a business, you've got, 35 unread emails in your inbox. It feels like another job. And it's not like you didn't have a very, very full-time job to begin with. Do you think you just hate doing both? And I am so lucky he said that. For somebody who was not that, frankly, like into the idea of me doing this at the beginning, for him to say that was amazing because wow. it helped me come to the realization that I couldn't do both well and I couldn't do both at once. The business piece was getting to be so much that I was getting like 60 emails a day. I was like, I need management. I need someone to help me with this stuff. And no management will take you on if you have a full-time job. Mm. They want people who are committed. Mm. I get that, right? Like you're not gonna hire somebody who has another job. They're not, you guys are not on the same page. Um, so instead I was like, okay, like I want management. I want all these things to happen for me. And for me to do that, I need to, be committed to this. So a year and three months in, I quit my full-time job 
And it was the scariest thing I had to do because it wasn't like I was leaving a job that I hated. It wasn't so easy as leaving my Wall Street job because I was like, I hate everybody here. Like, I mean, you suck. literally had a guy complimenting your card and calling it a kimono. Right. Like, I, I, I'm like, I hate you. I can't wait to get out of here. I already have, you know, a celebratory dinner planned. It wasn't like that. I liked my boss. I liked my friends there. People treated me nice. I was making a lot of money. And there were definitely moments where I'm like, am I like an idiot for doing that? Like who walks away from a job that pays $625,000 a year with a boss that advocates for them every year? A boss they like, a boss that they get along with, with coworkers that are nice to them, remember their birthday, bring little snacks to share at work. Like who does that? And I thought about it in how 50 year old Vivian would think about it. I did not want to become 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line and look back on this moment and think, what if? So in my head, I started to make a plan. I was like, okay, I can leave right now and go do this for a year, two years. And if it blows up in my face, I can always come back to this job or a job similar to this job. They'll take me. I was the top yeah. player. Like people know my name. People liked working with me. I had a really strong, good reputation of like bringing in monster deals while also treating people with respect. People liked me. So I was like, okay, I have done myself a favor in that way. I can come back to this job, but I don't know how long I have this Your Rich BFF opportunity for. It could be gone tomorrow. Like I, I still talk about it that way. I'm like, being a creator is like being an NFL player. You get five good years, then you blow out your knee and it's over, right? Like how many creators, how many influencers do you know have been Very around few. for 40 years? None. The influencer has not even been around the term for 40 years. So I was like, let me just give it a go. And luckily for me, it really started to pay off just that very first year. And the money started to make sense. And before I quit, I had set aside $100,000 in cash so that I was like, I can always pay my rent. I can always buy groceries. And so I told my boyfriend at the time, now fiance, I told him, well, what, what if we get to year two? And I've burned through all of this money on rent. I've burned through all of this money on groceries with our life. And I don't have anything to show for it. And this is where I think I had a parachute that so many other creators don't have. My fiance and I had been together at that point, together already five years. And so he said to me, he's like, well, we've already been together five years. I'm not going anywhere. Nobody starves on an investment banker's income. And he was, you know, making multiple six figures at the time. And he was like, we'll never starve on this money. So we'll always be able to keep renting. We'll always be able to put groceries on the table. Sure, maybe we won't have to, we won't be able to go on as many vacations. We won't be able to take as many Ubers. We'll have to take the train. Like there will be certain lifestyle sacrifices that we have to make, but it'll never be a dire situation. And that gave me so much comfort because I always knew I had an eject seat. I always had that parachute to save me in case something bad happened. I didn't need it. And I feel so fortunate for that. Your Rich BFF has grown beyond my wildest imagination. I am able to help people. I'm able to make money. I'm able to reach my dreams while helping other people reach their dreams. I mean, I can't ask for anything else. And I wake up every day, even on days when I'm having bad days, I'm like, I feel really lucky to be able to do this. You had someone who believed in you. In fact- And it was the guy who did it. Yeah. It was the guy who was like, why are you doing this? And when I asked him about that, I was like, why would you agree to subsidize this little endeavor if you didn't even believe in me in the beginning? And he said, Vivian, I never said, I didn't believe in you. I didn't like seeing you distraught because you couldn't make enough content on Sundays. I didn't like seeing you sad. I didn't like seeing you in a position where you were tired all the time. He's like, it had nothing to ever do with the fact that I didn't believe in you. He always believed in you. He always did. And I'm lucky. I'm lucky like that. Um, you can indeed find love in a hopeless place. I met him in a dive bar. So there's hope for all of us. And I think about this a lot because I think our generation of Asian American creators and entrepreneurs this is our version of taking a risk. 
This is our version of moving to America. Yes. It's where (laughs) we go and we put in our work and dues, building the relationships and hard work and salary so that one day we decide to take a chance on something new, which is tied to our passions, but we still think about it like, okay, if it doesn't work, one year later, I had the exact same thoughts as you. I was like leaving Instagram. I'm like, okay, I can spend a year. Yeah, but yeah. at 50 years old, one year will literally mean nothing. nothing. If yeah. I could have been making this at 49 and making it 50, who the f- cares? And I have enough money to support myself. And if it doesn't work out, they'll hire me back They'll again. hire me back. So from a risk benefit analysis, yeah. <laughs> I need to do this. And I had a best friend, my future co-founder, who really believed that I and we could do this. Yeah. And it's so funny because it's like the mix of support we get from our friends, our mentors, our relationships, and the work we've done ourselves to get that way. Mm -hmm. That's what gets us over the edge. That's our version of taking a big risk. Yeah, it is. And I really think it speaks to that rule. It's like you are a product of the people around you. If you've got people who are haters around you, cut them out of your life. Cut, 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 because they're only going to bring you down to their level. They can't raise themselves up, so they just bring you down because water meets its own level, right? If you have a conscientious partner, supportive friends, mentors who can guide you through some hard, and I mean hard decisions, you're golden because those are, those are like the devil angel, everybody on your shoulder, they help inform the decisions I make. In the same way that like, I think about this like in college, we had a girlfriend, she kept going back to this one guy and we all hated him. Like we all hated his guts. It took us being like literally not a single one of us likes him. He's a bad person. You su- like, like you should not be with them for her to finally get there. And I'm like, Yo, if you had stayed with that toxic dude, this happy little family does not exist. And it's important who you have around you. Because if you have friends who are just encouraging bad behavior, encouraging bad decision-making, like you'll stay in that cycle forever. And it causes you to miss out on really key, really important opportunities that again, have the ability to change the trajectory of your life. And I think about my life as pivotal moments. Like everything in between is just gravy, but like the pivotal moments are getting into that school, getting that first job, leaving that first job. But throughout that, having my mentor and I think, you know, meeting my fiance, pivotal moment and building your rich BFF as a pivotal moment because it has completely changed the trajectory of my life. I did a financial planning conversation back in 2020, right before I started your rich BFF. And we made a plan and it was an excellent plan. And I felt very confident about the future and everything was wonderful. My fiance and I looked back on that plan recently and it's, you know, and it wasn't even like that recently. It was like probably like 2022, like end of 2021, right after we had bought our home. And we looked at it and we laughed because we were like, this couldn't, this like is so off, so, so off by factors of 10, because our lives have changed so much since that day. And it's a point of pride because all of that change has been great. Yeah. And you have to be ready to accept opportunities because when they come, they only come once. Yeah. People always forget that risk tolerance isn't just a function of risk appetite, it's a function of privilege. And privilege refers not just to financial wealth, but your relationships. And also preparation. Yes. You got to be ready. (laughs) When the moment comes, you have to rise to meet it. The relationships in your life, I'll say this, similarly to you, the friendships and mentors I've had have irrevocably altered the trajectory of my life. Very similar. It's partially why did I leave finance to go into tech? Why did I leave tech to go do a startup? It's because people around me were like, this makes sense. And I have two thoughts from that. The first one is, I'll tell you, as much as I love my parents and I know I meant the best for me, it really sucked not having them on my side. Yeah. And the second thing is, I like didn't know how to make friends for like the longest time. (laughs) (laughs) 
Making friends as an adult yeah. is so challenging. Like for me, you know, when I was like 12 years old, my dad came to me and he was like, you know, this kid in your school, you should go be friends with him because his parents are rich. Oh my God. Because he Did didn't you? know any better. No, because like even as a 12 year old, who's like dumb as fuck, intuitively something yeah. felt wrong. As an adult, I can now say explicitly, oh, the idea that friendship is purely a means to an end. The idea that you should be friends with someone because of their financial status and how it could benefit them. <sighs> but at the time, I didn't know. I just like, this feels wrong and weird. But for a long time, I had so much struggle fitting in the context of how do you build real, genuine relationships and friends yeah. in a mentality where I'm like, doggy dog, like, got to get what's yeah, mine. Like, yeah, got to yeah. work hard, got to get money. And I think in the beginning, it was a little of the, well, like, you know, friendships and relationships are also beneficial from a networking POV. Yeah. So this is how I do it. And then eventually it became, oh, but like, they're, they're, they're like my friends and I care about them. And it's yeah. more than just the benefit that I really value and treasure. I think um, what I like to say is that every single friendship I have is a cost benefit analysis. And people don't like to hear that, but hear me out, okay? So think about your best friend. What does your best friend provide you? What do you provide them? What kind of value do they bring to you? I am the richest out of all of my friends. All of my friends have like probably mountains of student debt because they all went to graduate school. Wow. All, like most of my advanced friends. Advanced degrees. Advanced, like one of my best friends is a surgery resident. She's gonna become a plastic surgeon. She is mountains of debt. Uh, I, had a, I have a girlfriend who's currently finishing her last year of law school, gonna become an attorney, mountains of debt. I have two girls who just finished uh, business school at Booth, U Chicago Booth. So like they have one of the best MBAs yeah. in the country. And these are the more traditional paths. Yes. They all have less money than me. I get so much value out of being their friends because I will tell you, the girl who is a surgery resident, nobody makes me laugh harder than her. She brings me joy. One of the girls who went to business school, she's the person who would always be there for me. If I had something go wrong, she's the person who I would call. She brings me comfort. I have friends who bring me companionship, love, happiness, support. The same friends that were telling me all those good things, like that supported me in doing this, those are value and they have value to them. You need to think about the people in your life. When you're done hanging out with them, do you feel better or worse? Do you feel energized or do you feel drained? Because that's how you start to decide the value of that friendship. Mm. And I had some friendships that were taking away from my, my number, we'll call it. I think we all wake up every day and on a scale of zero to 100, you wake up at a number. Energy, vibes, everything. After hanging out with a friend who is valuable and good for you, your meter should be higher you should feel better. You should feel happy. When you hang out with someone who's not good for you, your meter's lower. And that's how I was deciding who I wasn't going to see anymore because it wasn't a good use of my time. That applies to, to your relationship partner. In fact, that might 100%, 100%. be the biggest determinant of how you feel and that number. Yeah. You mentioned you met your fiance in a dive bar. So yeah. in the real world, this wasn't <laughs> even on Hinge. Okay, so it was like it was like IRL Hinge though because he worked with my girl roommate at the time. So they were coworkers. So it's not like he was like some random stranger. Like I knew he wasn't a serial right. killer. He wasn't the mysterious smoldering right, guy. Right, right. Like he had come into work, sat next to my roommate for like okay. months now. Like we like we knew who he was. But we did meet when I crashed one of the analyst associate events and we just like really hit it off. We we shared a tequila shot and had a quick dance floor makeout. And then we didn't talk for six months. Man did not ask me for my number, never saw him again. I was like, okay, well that was nice. Cool, move it along with my life, whatever. Six months later, you can see what I was doing around this time of my life. I met him again at another dive bar. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're just going to 
Bars and parties, basically. Lit oh my God. So I, this I mean, is like, when you were still at JP Morgan? Yeah, I was in my early 20s. I had just gone to New York City. That's all I wanted to do. I was swinging from the chandeliers. Like, couldn't you could not tell me otherwise. So I, I meet him again. And that's actually how we ended up really, really connecting. So we were at this bar. Um, after we all left this bar, we were all day drinking because it was like the Friday of a long weekend. So the Friday we had off. Yeah. Um, so we were like, okay, we have nothing to do tomorrow. Tomorrow's Saturday. It's amazing. Myself and a crew of like eight people ended up going back to him and his roommate's apartment because they had a roof and we ended up having a little barbecue and we ended up spending hours together. And that's when I was like, oh, like this person's like actually cool and like worth spending time with and like funny and like has good insights or like tells good stories or like we vibe and there haven't been any like red flags going off. And then the next weekend we went on our first date. Did he ever acknowledge in that first barbecue hangout, oh yeah, I'm sorry I made out with you and then didn't reach out or talk to you for six no. months? No. So you just like met and what? Did you like acknowledge you had met before? It was just like, hello person, I'm meeting for the first time. No, but like, we, like it was like a situation where we both knew. Right. But you kind of had to just be like, be cool about this. Right, because you're with friends. Because it's, it's awkward. Context. You were both so, like, we were both, like, just, like, partying. We were, like, drunk. And it was, like, you know, fun. But it was just a nice situation. Yeah. Where I met someone really organically. And it didn't feel forced at all. And, like, it was also nice that, like, his friends were my friends. Mm. Like, he knew my roommate. Like, can confirm. Not, not axe murderer. Like, can confirm. Like, normal at work. Mm. Like, doesn't have some weird habit that like yeah. is like a big big turn like secret red flag yeah like no icks and i was like oh, okay cool like i can keep seeing this guy and what was the moment that became i'm really serious about him and i'm gonna marry him oh from this guy that you met at a nyc party i will made say out i this is i'm like such a walking new york city trope we moved in together a month after dating because my, I moved into a new apartment with the same girl roommate and it ended up being roach infested. So we had to basically move out and we were like homeless for a month. So I lived with like him and she lived with her boyfriend at the time and we signed a new lease and then we moved into a new apartment together, me and this girl. And the day they moved out, the day we moved out of our boy, respective boyfriend's apartments, she broke up with that guy. Wow. And my fiance, now fiance, and I ended up getting so much closer and he had like helped me through this really difficult time in my life. Like, you know, I'm very afraid of bugs. Like just the fact that he would like, he like took me in. I like say that as like a sad little puppy dog. Like he took me in a month in, like, I think it like spoke a lot about like how much he cared and how invested he was in the relationship. And then after that, we started living together. And when we realized we could like live well together, he, like neither of us have like really annoying things that we do that really, really irritates the other person. You know, you start envisioning a life with this person because you're playing house. Mm. It's like you're already married. You're playing house. You live together. You go to work. You come back. You eat dinner together. Like that's when I really started to like envision a life with this person. And that relationship is ultimately what helped you really take a shot on your rich Yeah, BFF. Exactly. <laughs> So I do credit a lot of my success to my partner, my friends, yeah. my mentor. You know, I think at the end of the day, I'm the one who has to ideate, who has to film, who has to edit, who has to do the labor. But of course, without that emotional support, I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. And it's important to have. And that's a wrap. Vivian, thank you so much for making time. I know you're working on a book as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and if anybody who is watching or listening is interested in reading my book, it's called Rich AF, The Winning Money Mindset That'll Change Your Life. It releases on December 26th, 2023, and you can order it at richaf.me. Yes, I made the URL a manifestation. I want all of the besties to be rich. Please buy this book. If yeah, there's anything I've learned book. Please buy this book. from this conversation, this is Asian American entrepreneurship, working really hard, getting support from her friends and mentors, not doing what her parents told us, <laughs> but finding, finding our own way to make it work and show support. Check out her book. You'll learn a lot. Manage your finances better. Vivian, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. That's good. <laughs>